Our Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you because your word is here for us to study. And we know that the Spirit of God will lead us and guide us and show us what you want us to know even this very day from your word. We're praying that as we read, as we study, as we pray, as we commit ourselves to you, your perfect will will be done by us in us and through us in Jesus' name. Amen. That as we rise up to do your will, in your own way, in your own power, souls will be won. Many will be led into the kingdom and the church will be edified. Your holy name will be glorified. Help us in our study this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. The more we get into the Word of God, the more we discover God's power moving on to execute God's own plan. And in the chapter we're studying today, just the first four verses, we see the power of God and the wisdom of God as He continued His plan, His program, and it goes from one phase or one step to the other. Let me just read to you from Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, verses 1 to 4. And Saul was consenting to his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles and devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him as for Saul he made havoc of the church entering into every house and hailing men and women committed them to prison therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the world. The problem of persecution is something that was very, very common in Bible days and in Bible times. And those who read the Bible only on the surface and they see the stormy sea raging, they see the storm blowing, they see the wind, and they see the rain falling, all they see from the outside on the surface is what may terrify them. But those who reach the word of God, and while they're looking at the storm, they are secured in the chamber, in the inner chamber of God's own mighty presence, and right in the palm of God, in the bosom of God, right be before the throne, while they are settled in the bosom of their father, they're looking out of the window, and out there they see the storm, they see the wind, and they see the sea raging. Because they are very, they're in the very hands of the Almighty God, in the bosom of His love, in the power of the Holy Ghost, in the very presence of the Almighty, they know that the story is not on the surface, the story is down deep below. Beyond the storm, beyond the raging sea, the plan of God is going on according to God's timetable. You see, when people do not have the full faith in God, all they see will be on the surface. And you see anybody coming to read Acts of the Apostles chapter 8. Reading from the end of chapter 7, Stephen had been killed. Obviously that is something that will make the heart of the people who study on the surface, that will make them to tremble, to wonder what is going on. But I want to counsel you this, uh, this evening. Listen to me. Whenever you read your Bible, Whenever you look at the things that surround you, whenever you look at the situations and the circumstances that the church is passing through, before you ever interpret the situation, before you ever think about what is going on around the believers, around the church or in the Bible days, get into the bosom of God, get into his hands, get into his presence, get into the inner chamber where the Lord will be able to show you his very timetable, his plan, his program, his project. And he tells you whatever you see on the surface, the mysterious hand of the Almighty God is still working on. And as you come to chapter 8 of the Acts of the Apostles, 
and you read it, you are not going to the mountain top where the wind is blowing, where you are alone, isolated, and lonely, and depressed, and discouraged. Reading Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8. Because, you know, if you are coming from a journey where you are already torn up, and, dis and di discouraged, and distressed, and you come into Act Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, and you read the first few verses, you are likely to say, well, I said so that I don't know whether I will be able to make it. But you know, if you are just having the right attitude and the right eyesight, the right insight, the right understanding, and the proper faith, and your God is great, and your God is on the throne, and the stormy sea doesn't un unthrone or doesn't unseat your God, when you read a passage like we're reading now, you will know that miracles are on the way. You know, for a believer, you should be seeing miracles every day. Miracles every day. Whatever the condition around you, whatever the storm on the sea, whatever the raging in the, on the sea, whatever the circumstances, you should be seeing the miracles every day. And you know, the early church, they saw those miracles every time every time and um, this is why i'm limiting myself to just four verses because there is so much in these acts of the apostles chapter 8 that um, it will need to go very very slowly for us to gather honey out of the rock and it's only the believers let's face it only believers who can get honey out of the rock and if you'll just be patient if you allow the Lord to open your eyes, you'll see that the rock is not dry. The rock has all that we need to supply our needs. Now, in Acts of the Apostles chapter 8, we come to the opening of the verse of the chapter. And it says, And Saul was consenting unto his death. Listen to me. For the unbeliever, whenever you mention death, that is the end of the whole issue. You mentioned death, its program, its project, its plan, everything has come to an end. You mentioned death, its hope, its life, everything that brings joy has come to an end. You mentioned death before a believer and he knows life is following immediately. Immediately you mention death in the Bible. If a man of faith is reading it, if a man that has spiritual insight is reading it, dynamic life, resurrection life is just about to follow. And if you'll just read on and you go around the corner, you'll be seeing the life of God. Vitality, victory coming on after you have mentioned death. Because when the devil is trying to do his worst, God is taking that negative, is developing it right in the dark room, and is bringing a bright picture. And when he brings that bright picture, you'll be surprised. You'll say, out of the negative I saw just now, look at the picture that has come out. Because the Lord, God in heaven, is always able to take the negative and turn it into the poor city. Now, Stephen had died, but he had gone into the bosom of the Father. But don't forget, he died only because only because his own ministry had ended all that the lord wanted him to do all that the lord wanted him to say everything had been said everything had been done and then he went home you said but they stoned him you don't understand because when you look at a person that is being stoned when a criminal is being stoned that is the way the criminal will feel because there is no comforter, because there is no support, because there is no power, because there is no hope, because there is no confidence, because there is nothing to challenge him to know that you are going to a place. But you know what? They were stoning that man. He didn't cry, oh pain, because death has no sting and the grave has no victory over a man that is seeing the heavens open and seeing the Son of Man, the Son of God, standing on the right hand of God. 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they passed through the fires, and Jesus Christ came to them right there. But I'm asking you a question, did the fire burn them? No. Because when you pass through the fires, it doesn't burn. It doesn't burn because the burning bush will give you a surprise. It's a strange sight that the bush is not consumed. They were stoning that man, Stephen. He never cried for pain. While they were stoning him, he collected himself. He knelt down. Have you ever seen a person being stoned on the street and then he will kneel down? You, you can't do that if you are not in the power of the Holy Ghost. While the stones were falling, he wasn't even conscious of the stone. He just knelt down. And he looked up and he saw Jesus Christ still there. And he said, Lord Jesus, I'm coming home. I'm coming home. And it's so nice wanting to come home right now. And then we're told, he said, Oh Lord, receive my spirit. And then before that, he said, lay not this sin against their church. Uh, did you hear a cry of agony, a, a cry of pain, a cry of anguish? And then we're told, he fell asleep. Not that he wriggled in pain and he rolled. No, he, after he had prayed the prayer because of the presence and the power of God and because Jesus was standing and death had no pain for him and the grave had no victory for him, he just fell asleep. He had prayed a prayer and that prayer you'll see the effect as we go on because the ringleader was converted. Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus. I can hardly wait talking to you about Saul that later became Paul. But uh, we must go on systematically. Now he has gone. And we're told in verse 2, devout men carried Stephen to his burial. And they made great lamentation over him. Now, after that, a transitional period in the history of the church started. Dynamic, productive outreach of the church came as a result of Stephen's death and the scattering of the church. The Holy Ghost always, always turns disaster into victory giving us greater opportunity a greater success a greater victory a greater expansion a greater extension a greater outreach in the preaching of the gospel listen to me god can always use negative situations to produce positive results look at your own life if you will look at the situations in your life whatever the situation may be if you look at that situation from the platform of the throne of the Almighty God, from the very presence of God, from the power of God, and you are right in the bosom of the Father while the sea is raging, while the storm is a blowing, while it appears that situations are contrary, if you remain in the bosom of Jesus, if you remain in the presence and the power of God, the Almighty, you'll see him turning negative situations into positive, productive results. And from this chapter 8, the church took a giant step toward fulfilling the Great Commission. You know, the church was mainly Jewish until this time. Through the persecution, gospel preaching extended to Judea and Samaria, following the pattern of expansion previously outlined by Jesus Christ. Now, look at this verse 1 again. At that time, there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. There was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. Stop right there. Is that new? Is it not the same old story? Because I read in my Bible of the children of Israel in Egypt, and there was a great persecution against them. What do you find in Exodus chapter 1? Don't open, I'll just tell you that uh, Pharaoh decided he was going to wipe out the children of Israel. And he determined it so much and he raised up a great plan that must have been suggested by the devil himself to wipe away those people. What do you read about? As much as they were persecuted, tormented, and tortured, they grew mightier. They grew greater. And they grew in multitude. And eventually, you know, even Moses, that was picked up by the banks of River Nile, 
that was the Moses that was called and trained in the court of Pharaoh. And this was the man that came back some years later with the rod of God in his hand. And miracles were performed until Pharaoh said, Now I know that God. You go and worship that God. It's not a new thing. They were by the riverside, mountains on both sides. And Pharaoh and the chariots of Egypt, they were following after them. And the inexperienced uh, children of Israel, they started crying, saying, What are we going to do? Israel, listen, that's not a new story. That's not a new story. The devil has always tried, but he has always failed. God has always proved that he is the God of gods, the Lord of lords, and the King of kings. And as they were crying, Moses, the man of God, told them, Stand still. Don't tremble. Don't move. Don't be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And uh, a stretch of the rod, they passed over. They passed over the Red Sea. And the children of Egypt, uh, they, they are said to do likewise. And they said, we'll follow after them. We'll destroy them. You can't do it. You can't do it. Because if God is for those people, there is nobody in heaven, in hell, or on earth, or under the earth, that can wipe them out or destroy them. Take it from the word of God. Because God is the eternal one, the great I am that I am. And you know, you can never go against God successfully. And you know, they went into the Red Sea with them. You know what happened? God told Moses, stretch your rod, just a stretch of the rod, and the sea closed up on them, and they perished. And the children of Israel, they started singing, that is our God. Is it strange that at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. Haven't we read in our Bible that when Joshua and the people of Israel, when they got into Canaan, the people in Jericho, they closed their doors. Why? Oh no, we don't want to see them. Oh no, we don't want to have them. We're going to stamp them out. They locked all their gates and all their doors and nothing will ever get into the world through the walls of Jericho. Well, the plan of God will be fulfilled. God doesn't need a key from the people of the world to get into them. And the people of Israel, they were just marching along, just marching around. Again, the walls of Jericho came down. That is our God. After they had settled for some time, you'll remember that Saul was chosen as king. And eventually David came. David came on. While Saul was still there, the Philistines and Goliath, they said, well, we're just going to let Israel be forgotten as a nation. They were going to just defeat them and crush them. And Saul was trembling. But there was a young man coming from the very presence of God. He saw the difficulty, but he saw it with a, a deeper insight, a different eyesight. He was seeing it in a spiritual way. He said, don't let the mind of anybody be moved because of this. I will go, I will go ahead and, and get rid of him. They said, you cannot. He said, I will, I can, I must. That's my responsibility. That's why I'm here. And he went ahead. You know what happened? The stone he used was right in the territory of the enemy. God has no problem. God has no problem. You know, at the time of Samson, the jawbone that he used, that jawbone was right in the territory of the enemy. God has no problem. You know, the rod that Moses used, that rod was right in the territory of the backside of the desert where he had been going around all the time. You know, when Elijah had a problem and God wanted to feed him, the raven he used was right in the territory of that place. I'm saying that God is a mighty God who cannot go beyond him. And David went ahead and Goliath was, de was uh, defeated. Now it has come again. What will be the result? Persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad. Throughout the regions, listen to me, throughout the regions of Judea and uh, Samaria. What's the meaning of that? Acts chapter 1. Verse 8, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria. Where were they scattered? Judea and Samaria. That's what, that was the second point in God's timetable. God was in charge. There was no trouble at all. The devil thought he was making trouble. God was expanding the gospel and preaching the gospel through these people. 
And that was the program that Jesus Christ had given. And now the persecution came, and it was scattered abroad throughout all the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. What were the apostles doing in Jerusalem? Very interesting. Very interesting. Look at verse 14. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem had that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. The apostles remained in Jerusalem. Verse 25. And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and they preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. You see, they made Jerusalem their base. The question I'm asking you is this. When they persecuted that church in Jerusalem and they scattered those disciples, did they destroy the church in Jerusalem and Samuel? No, the apostles were there. Upon this rock I build my church. If it is his church, built upon the testimony of the blood of Jesus Christ, built upon the power of the cross, built upon the eternal gospel, built upon the word of God that changes not, that church cannot be destroyed. Upon this rock I build my church, and the very gates of hell cannot prevail against it. The disciples uh, were scattered, but then the apostles remained in Jerusalem because there was still a lively church there. Now it says that the apostles returned to Jerusalem, and in chapter 9, verse 26, you know some people that uh, will preach to you and they will say when the church was persecuted in Jerusalem there was no church anymore in Jerusalem but then the church now went to Judea and Samaria that uh, you know uh, God cancelled this program in, um, in Jerusalem my brother my sister there was nothing like that come back to Acts chapter 1 let me show you something Acts chapter 1 verse 8 but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. What's the next word? Both in Jerusalem, not first in Jerusalem, and then after that, we we'll finish that, we don't touch it anymore, no. Both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria. What's the interpretation? The interpretation is that when the gospel preaching is going on in Judea and Samaria, the work will still be going on in Jerusalem. That's a, that was the program. That was the plan. The work will be going on both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria. And the program of God will never be disturbed. Will never be disturbed. Listen to me. Pharaoh couldn't disturb the program of God. The Canaanites couldn't disturb the program of God. Goliaths couldn't disturb the program of God. The Hittites couldn't disturb the program of God. And Nebuchadnezzar couldn't disturb the program of God. Herod could not disturb the program of God from the beginning of the world till the end of the world. There is no man, even not even the devil, can disturb the program of God. It was still according to the plan of God, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in all Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. That's the word of God. And you know, the Lord was doing just that, just that. The church in Jerusalem remained. The apostles were still in Jerusalem, but then the disciples were scattered to go and publish the gospel. Now in, um, in um, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9, and I'm looking at verse 26, and when Saul was come to Jerusalem, this is chapter 9, and we're told in chapter 8, the, the disciples were scattered, and here in chapter 9, Saul, uh, when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he has said to join himself to the disciples. <laughs> Where are those disciples? Right in Jerusalem. Uh, God is wonderful. I'm praying that tonight the Lord will open our eyes in Jesus' name. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's like coals of fire. Uh, you smash it, you scatter it, the fire keeps on burning. You cannot put out that fire because the fuel, the oil that is supplying strength into that fire is not coming from an earthly source. It's coming from a heavenly source. 
and that fuel is always there. That Holy Ghost is still going on and the Holy Ghost is telling the church, I am around, don't worry about anything. The race is not for the sweet. It's not by power. It's not by might. It's by my spirit, says the Lord. And as long as the spirit is in the church, listen to me, the spirit of God will make sure the program of God goes on undisturbed. Undisturbed. The program of God. And you see, at this time, the Holy Ghost was still with them. And there were disciples in Jerusalem, here in chapter 9. And in verse 26, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. What has the persecution done? The persecution had made the church wiser. The persecution had made the church more careful. If anybody now wanted to join, they wanted to, to know whether he was a real disciple or not. And in verse 27, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared and um, declared unto them how how he had seen the lord in the way and he had spoken unto him and how he had preached boldly at Jeru at uh, damascus in the name of jesus and he was with them coming in and going out where listen to me very well now in chapter 8 he went even to the houses Hailing men and women into prison. He knew the house fellowships. And he went there to disturb even their house fellowships. And he went to the places anywhere he could see those believers and he was scattering them. Look up here. Look up here. There were some people he couldn't touch. Their names were called apostles. Those people with apostolic authority, apostolic power, apostolic boldness apostolic anointing apostolic faith apostolic evidence of the mighty god working with them paul couldn't do anything against them so rather and, but he went to the believers in, in the various houses but do you know what he got converted in acts chapter 9 when he got converted in acts chapter 9 he came back to that same jerusalem you know what he was doing he was attending house fellowship Praise the Lord. Amen. Going in and out among the believers right in Jerusalem. When they did not want to receive him as a disciple, he was begging and he was looking for a disciple that will introduce him, recommend him to the church of the Lord. Saying, I am a disciple, I am born again. And Barnabas said, receive him, he is one of us. You see him that that wild attitude is no more upon his face. He is now submitting to the, uh, to the authority of those apostles. And they received him into fellowship. And he was going in and out. In and out. What they ate, he ate. What they studied, he studied. How they prayed, he prayed. When they went to house fellowship, he went. I said, praise the Lord. The Lord is wonderful. I, I mean, I, I, I just imagine God... While Saul or Tarsus was making all that trouble, all that trouble, I imagine God sitting on the throne, leaning back in the armchair and smiling and laughing and talking to Jesus Christ, his son, and saying, next chapter, we get him. And you know, just next chapter, he was going on business and uh, God got him. And you know, when the believers are praying and they say, God, catch him. That's the greatest prayer you can ever pray. And you know, God just caught him and now in chapter 9, he was begging for fellowship. I'm saying that God is a mighty God and God is a powerful God. And the program of God, the project of God, the plan of God, there is nothing on this earth that can stop it because the church is built on the rock and there is no gate of hell, no power from hell that can stop that church. When you mention that name, heaven will bow, earth will bow, and the powers of the devil will crumble. And so you can see that the church was still going strong, even in Jerusalem. Now let's look at um, chapter 11. Chapter 11 of the Acts of the Apostles. I'm reading verse 22. And then tidings uh, of these things came unto the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem. There was still a church in Jerusalem, and the church was going stronger and stronger. In verse 27. 
in these days came the prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. There was still that church in Jerusalem. And in chapter 12, verse 24, But the word of God grew and multiplied, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem. When they had fulfilled their ministry, and they took of them, John, whose surname was Mark, in um, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 21. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 21. I'm reading from verse 17. When we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. They were brethren in Jerusalem. Even after that, now look at verse 20. When they had heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe. Right in Jerusalem there. How many thousands? thousands, thousands of uh, Jews that believe even after that persecution. Come back to Acts chapter 8. I've shown you all that in those passages to tell you this. That the church was not weakened by persecution. The church was not cancelled or destroyed by persecution. The church was only strengthened. The church was empowered. The church uh, received a greater vision, a greater opportunity, and there was greater expansion, and there was greater extension of gospel preaching as, as a result of the persecution that came. Now, in the four verses we're studying, I want to look just at only two things. One, the persecution, and two, the preaching. From verse one, which I've been already studying with you, let me read it again to you, and Saul, was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there, there was a great persecution, a great persecution, a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men, religious men, devoted men, carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, every house, and hailing or hauling. Men and women committed them to prison. They didn't ask them any question. It was just that if they were believers, if Jesus was their Lord, if Jesus was their Savior, if they were called by the name of Christ, if they prayed to the Lord God in heaven in the name of Jesus, that was it. That was it. They will take them, if they were believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, they believed in the death of Jesus, in the resurrection of Jesus, they believed that only in the name of Jesus you could be saved, and they had experienced that salvation, and there was a change in their lives, and they were known to be believers. That was enough to carry them and haul them into prison. That was the work that Saul was doing. Now about persecution. Jesus had told us before he left. In John chapter 16, verse 33. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. Listen to me. In persecution, if the Lord remains with you and you remain with the Lord, if the Holy Ghost remains within you and you remain under the control of the Holy Ghost, in persecution, if God remains your father and you remain his child, there will be something inside your heart. It is called peace that passes understanding. There will be joy unspeakable. There will be peace that passes understanding. There will be the confidence and the faith in God that God is on the throne. You will not be afraid. You will not be trembling. You will not be running from the Lord. You will not be hiding out. You will not be doing anything that is unscriptural. These things have I spoken unto you that in me, in me, while you remain in the Lord, in the time of that persecution, you know that all that is on the surface is only on the surface. It doesn't reach beyond the surface. Ye might have peace. In the world, ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have, I have, I have 
overcome the world. There's nothing to make you afraid again because there's nothing to be afraid of. Nothing to be afraid of. Nothing to be afraid of. God is on the throne. God has his timetable. God is going through his timetable. You know, I told uh, you before, as an individual believer, what you will do, you will do. What God wants you to do, you will do. At the time he wants it done, in the period he wants it done, you will not be a minute behind the schedule, be behind the timetable. God has a timetable for your life. God has a timetable for, for the ministry he has given to you. And if you'll just remain in Christ, there is nothing that is happening out there in the world on the sea uh, there is nothing in the storm that can delay the hand of god or call back the program of god what the believers will do they will do the time he won't sit down in me you shall have peace in the world there'll be tribulation there'll be trouble but then he says don't worry about it i have overcome the world already i have overcome the world already now when you know now look up here Suppose um, you happen to be a student and you are taking an exam and before you ever went in for, to the exam hall, your teacher called you and you know this teacher is going to mark the thing and he says, well, listen here, I have no joy in your failure. I've been teaching you all these five years and now you are going to take this exam. Cool down. There is no way you can fail that exam. If you fail that exam, you know that I'm not a man of my word. You know I'm insincere. You know I'm dishonest. You know I'm deceitful. You know I'm not worth my, uh, my name. You cannot fail that exam. So just go in and uh, the result is determined before you ever have that exam. Go in and, and do what you want to do. You will not be trembling when you are writing that exam. Now Jesus Christ the Lord. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today and forever. Jesus Christ was sending us to go and do the work he has given us to do. He called us before the exam and he said, Children, cheer up. There is no way you can fail that exam. There is no way you can be defeated in that exam. Because I have over overcome the world, you are going to overcome. Now you go out and do what I want you to do. Think about it. Think about it. Think about it, that already the success and the victory has been given to us before even the day of battle. How wonderful our God is. And so you see, the Lord has already told us that in the world there will be tribulation, there will be problem. But then he says, be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Matthew chapter 24. I want you to see this. Matthew chapter 24. Verse 6. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Now, when as a believer you hear that, what do you think about? You hide your head. You run away for your life. You say, I want to be careful. I want to do this. I want to do that. But then after he said, you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Then he said, see that ye be not troubled. See that ye be not troubled. The war is not, is not for you, it's for the world. It's not supposed to crush you and to destroy you and to dampen your faith and to make you look away from the Almighty God. See that you be not troubled. And then in verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. There will be wars, there will be rumors of wars, there will be pestilence, there will be trouble, there will be earthquake, and yet... On top of it, on top of it, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. We thank God because we are serving a victorious God. A God that never lost any battle. A God who knows what he's doing. And a God, when he sends us out, he gives us the power, the equipment, the enablement, the anointing, the unction, the Holy Ghost, the helper to go along with us to do what we ought to do. In the way we ought to do it and at the time we ought to do it. And so there was this persecution. Now Saul talked about it later. Because after his conversion, he always looked back with gratitude and he said, I was a blasphemer. I was an injurious person. I was a persecutor. But the Lord forgave me because I did it in ignorance. 
now from the persecution let's go to the preaching the children of God the disciples had been scattered now what are they going to do in verse 4 therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word my brothers my sisters I want you to look up here now we come to a section that requires the help of a teacher you know God gave some apostles he gave some prophets he gave some evangelists he gave some pastors and some teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ you see if there were no teachers in the church the church will just be running helter skelter helter skelter and the church will not do what the Lord wants done at the time the Lord wants it done now listen to me and I want to teach you the Word of God because it's uh, something to read the Bible and just read verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, and verse 4 and say, well, they were all scattered abroad and they were preaching the word everywhere, just preaching the word. And so, yes, I thank God because I'm a preacher. I'm going to preach the word. Now, listen to me. How do you preach the word? Where do you preach the word? When do you preach the word? What method do you use in preaching the word? What is it that they really did? Now listen. They were in Jerusalem. And the persecution arose. And the persecution uh, made them to say, Well, uh, you must not uh, preach this thing in Jerusalem here. And um, the disciples, they just went out of Jerusalem because the persecution was so great. And they were imprisoning them, just locking them up. And while they were locking them up, as they were releasing them, because they knew they would come and catch them again, they were getting out of Jerusalem. You see, isn't that being a coward? That's why you need a teacher. A teacher that will show you the mind of God, the way of God, the word of God. Now, come back to Matthew again. Let's hear from Jesus Christ himself. Matthew chapter 10 Matthew chapter 10 verse 22 and verse 23 and when and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake but he that endureth to the end the same shall be saved now there may be persecution there may be hatred but the Lord wants us to endure to the end to believe the word of God to the end. To stand on the word of God unto the end. Because it's only as we do that we shall be saved. Now look at verse 23. Have you ever seen this before? Verse 23. But when they persecute you in this city. What's the next thing? What is it? Lean to another. Listen, look up here. It's good to read Bible. You know, God is a wonderful God. And this Bible, I wish I had, wouldn't it be wonderful if I can have three hours just to continue teaching you. I mean, we come from Monday Bible study and we start at 5.30 and I start talking about 6 o'clock and I just go on standing here and you sitting down there just opening Bible upon Bible upon Bible and I just go on for three hours just teaching you the word of God. I'm looking for that day. I mean, just to read the Bible. The Bible is wonderful. Everybody say wonderful. wonderful. <laughs> you know, believers who never read the Bible, you know what they do? When there is persecution and they tell them now you must not preach in the bus, you must not preach in the bus, immediately they send that Lord. Oh, they say, we are going to preach, we are going to preach, we are going to preach. And they go right into that bus and they start preaching. Jesus didn't say that. Jesus didn't say that. Jesus said, when you are persecuted in this city, now the message is still there. 
the power is still there, the anointing is still there, what you are to do is to go to another city, to go and preach there. And let the trouble go down in this city when the trouble is now here and people are getting converted here and they lay hands on you there again, come back to this other place where there is no trouble now and continue preaching. While they start persecuting you there, then run to another city, start preaching, people getting saved. If they make trouble again, they go from that place, go to another city. Isn't God wonderful? But you know, those who don't read any Bible, and it, only one verse in the Bible they know, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And in the bus is where they find all the creatures in the world. They don't know any other thing. And so if they say, don't preach in the bus, oh, they say, we're going to do it, we're going to do it. And they go right back to that bus, and they waste their energy, they waste their time, they waste their resources, and nobody is listening to them, and the law enforcement officers are harassing and tormenting them. But you know what Jesus said? When they persecute you in this city, flee into another, for verily I say unto you, you shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. Come back to Acts chapter 8, and I'm reading verse 4. Acts chapter 8, I'm reading verse 4. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Uh, you know they didn't say, no, we are going to stay in Jerusalem. Even though they are scattering us, even though there is an edict, even though there is a law, even though they are going against the preaching in Jerusalem, we are going to do it. Now, look up here. This is uh, the headquarters church of Deeper Christian Life Ministry. And it's the headquarters. If Jesus tarries out of this place, the seed of truth, the seed of the gospel, the seed of the message of life will be going out of this place into all parts, not only in Nigeria, all parts of Africa and beyond Africa. It is going to be done because Jesus died for the people in Nigeria and Africa. And the Lord is going to be sending the word out. But listen to me. When there is restriction in one area, the church must use the wisdom of God, be wise as serpents, and be gentle, harmless as doves. And you know, when there is persecution in one area, you are reaching out in another area. If there is no opportunity in the boss today, or tomorrow, or this week, or this month, there are many other areas where the avenue is opened and you are preaching the gospel all the time. Wherever you go, whatever you are doing, you are preaching the gospel. And you know what? Everywhere I go, I find that people are hungry for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Haven't you discovered that? Everywhere you go, everywhere you go, you find that people are hungry for the, um, for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let me show you this, verse 5. Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Now the word preach here is euangelizo. And it means to give the good news, to pass it on. You may be telling an individual, you may be telling a neighbor, you may be telling, you may be telling a friend, you are passing on the good news. It's news because he has never heard it before. It is good because it is coming at the right time. If he has heard it before, is it news again? If it is coming too late, is it good? If it's not applicable to him, it is, good. is it good news for him? But it is good news because it's appropriate. It's coming at the right time and you are passing it on to him that he needs it. It's good news for him. And you are giving out, you are passing out the good news. Look at verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. The word preach in verse 5 is another word, is keruso. And it means to proclaim as a herald, as an anointed, a gifted, a commissioned evangelist to make a public proclamation. Now listen to me. If you cannot preach in the sense of keruso, in the sense of standing in a public place on a street corner, in the sense of standing before a multitude of people to proclaim as a herald, as a committed, gifted, anointed evangelist, you can preach in the sense of evangelism, that is to just give the good news, to pass it on, to tell your neighbor, to tell your friend, and to tell the people about the good news of the Lord. So you see, they were persecuted in Jerusalem. 
they didn't remain adamant and say, oh yes, even though they are persecuting us, we like to remain in that Jerusalem and do it. No, there is a change of location. There is a change of method. There is a change of place. And when believers are hindered in one area, believers must go back to God and ask for wisdom. Ask for insight. Ask for the understanding that so that they will still be able to preach the gospel, but not preach it in a way that you are not going against the laws of the government. Because they didn't say, don't preach at all at all. They won't say that. If they said that, we will preach. Because the word of God declares, go into all the world and preach the gospel to, the, uh, to every creature. And nobody can tell me, for example, don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you tell me not to, I will. I'm a believer already and I've made up my mind. I'm going to be a believer till I die. But, but you know, if they tell me, well, uh, don't um, use a loudspeaker to disturb other people, it's all right. That's all right. Because I can adapt technology and use earphone uh, for all these other people in the language area. And if they tell me not to stand in the bus, well, after all, how many people are in the bus? About 50 people, about 80 people. I can go over the television and even stop reaching 50 people and reach uh, 50,000 people. So then, if uh, there is a law, you must wait upon the Lord and ask God for wisdom so that you are not going against uh, any law anywhere uh, so far as you are able to obey the Lord. Now, if we're going to obey the Lord in preaching the gospel, preaching the gospel, how can we preach today? A time is gone, but let me just tell you this. We can preach by letter writing. Have you ever tried that? Have you ever tried that? By letter writing. You see, Luke understood the gospel. And he remembered there was a man called Theophilus. And he took his pen and he wrote a long letter. Having 24 chapters. The gospel according to St. Luke. And he wrote it to Theophilus. Telling him about the life of Jesus. The ministry of Jesus. The death of Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus. And the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ. You can preach the gospel through letter writing. You can uh, preach the gospel by just taking up your telephone and just uh, talking the gospel over the telephone. Now, you'll see that I've written a reference there. And you might be wondering, were they using telephone at the time uh, of the New Testament? How were you able to find a reference? Well, look up here. There was no telephone at that time. But they used whatever method they had in a friend communicating the gospel to another friend and today we are to use whatever method we have and telephone is one of those methods to tell the gospel to another individual then there is literature distribution literature distribution now today i was uh, invited to the television station to come and um, participate in a Christian program not our regular program that we're paying for this one we're not paying for it they just um, you know gave me the invitation I was there on um, on a Saturday to come and declare the gospel and I went with some members of the choir and I accepted it you know they were even saying would you be kind enough will you be good enough to come and help us and fill in the program and give us the gospel I said I'll just be too kind I'm coming and I went on a Friday, I was on a radio station and they wanted to know if I could come and, uh, you know, speak to the nation about something and I was too glad. Friday, I was over there recording. Saturday, I was in another place recording. This afternoon again, I went uh, to a place recording for television again. The word of God is going on. While I was, uh, while I was ready to record today, it's all right, go on clapping. That's wonderful. People can't understand what they say deeper life, you know, they preach, they laugh, they sing, they clap. You can never tell what they will do. This is a wonderful church. This is the best church I ever attended in my life. Now, this afternoon, I was, um, I was over there recording. And you know what? Somebody came to me and uh, he said, uh, please, Pastor, right at the place, in the, in, the, in the studio there, the person was already kneeling down and said, Pastor, pray for me. I said, let us finish the program. I'll meet you and come and pray for you. And um, now, let me finish the story. 
Now you see, when we finished, I asked, I said, well, how did you know about this? Now listen to me very well now, because this is important. This is very important. She said, I was going on the road sometimes in Lagos, and I saw a sheet of paper on the ground, and I took it up, and I read about miracles taking place in Bagada. And uh, it was on Saturday, and then on Sunday, I traced Bagada myself. Nobody called me, nobody invited me, I saw the sheet of paper on the ground and then I picked up, I read it, I saw those miracles and I came to Bagada. They told the newcomers to stand up and I didn't stand up. I was too shy, I was too afraid to stand up and um, therefore I went back. But during the week, somebody just met me on the way and he said, you look like somebody coming to Bagada. And I said, well, I was there the other Sunday. And then the person took her to house fellowship. And now she's coming to the meeting. She's going to the house fellowship. Look at it. Look at it. Just seeing the literature on the ground. We can preach the gospel by distributing literature. All those miracle and revival news. We can give to friends. We can give to neighbors. We can give to co-workers. Just quietly passing on the good news. And then by invitation, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. We can preach the gospel that way, just visiting people and just helping them and just inviting them to the house of the Lord. And then by sharing our testimonies. Uh, you meet an individual and you are just telling about your testimonies. Telling about your testimonies. Everybody you meet, I was blind before now I can see. I was sick before now I'm well. I didn't have children before now I have. I didn't have a job before now God has done it for me. And God did it for me at Bagada. And he'll come along with you and the gospel will be preached unto him or her. And the person will receive the gospel. We can preach the gospel by just cultivating friendship with people. Talking to people about, uh, about the Lord. But only after we have cultivated their friendship, we call them friends, we just love them, we don't oppose them, we don't criticize them, we don't knock them down, we are just their friends. And as a result of the fact that we are their friends, we are sharing the gospel with them. And there is no law that says you mustn't have any friend. There is no law that says whatever you are talking with your friend, you must come and report in a particular office to monitor your discussion. There is nothing like that. We still can cultivate friendship. We still can have friends, uh, you know, among our neighbors, among our, uh, our acquaintances, and be sharing the gospel and testimony with them, inviting them to the, uh, to the church, to listen to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Apart from that, many times if you are listening to the Holy Ghost, the Lord will be touching you, touching your heart, and telling you, start praying for so-and-so or start going to see so and so and the lord can make you to have contacts contacts just reaching out to people and uh, the lord can so make your life challenging your life so radiant your life so powerful that everywhere that you go a positive influence will be upon your life and people will be asking where is your church take me there where is your church take me there now look up here this july this year I was, um, I went to London. Now, in London, there, there is uh, a person they had never met. Now, you know we have a small fellowship in London. Many of our brethren who left here and they went to study overseas and uh, they knew about deeper life there. They're fellowshipping with the fellowship in London. Now, uh, there was a brother. Uh, there is still a brother there. His name is Brother Amos. He had not, uh, he had married and he didn't have a child. And then he, he was uh, prayed for. After he was prayed for, he, God gave him twins, and that is what he said he, was, he wanted. And right there in London, uh, he saw a couple, the husband a medical doctor, the wife a medical doctor, both of them wives. And he started sharing with them and said that, uh, well, we serve a living God. Whenever we pray, the Lord always answers. And then this brother Amos shared his testimony of how God gave him twins. And uh, the doctor became interested because he had got married and he didn't have any child. And he said, well, I need prayer. He said, wait, I've had information. Our pastor from the headquarters in Lagos will be coming. And uh, this July, I went uh, with uh, Brother Alfred here. And the brother normally makes announcement here on Monday. And uh, oh, I went before him and he came to join me later. And uh, that day, uh, he was uh, right at the airport. That's uh, the white man. His wife waiting at home. And this man came to meet me and I was in his car. We were to go to his house first after I got down from the airport. 
and uh, he asked me, he said, you are the pastor I've been hearing about? I said, yes. Can you talk to me about the miracles, about the things that are taking place? I didn't have a copy of Miracle and Revival News uh, with me, but all the testimonies I've been hearing here on Thursdays, I began telling him, I began telling him, I began telling him. You know what happened? While we were going from the airport to his house, he missed the road to his house. <laughs> so we were, we were just going and going and going, and some, a brother that was following us, uh, you know, uh, trafficked and he waited, he said, Doctor, have you not missed the road to your house? Then he looked at the road, he said, Oh, I was so fascinated and so excited by the testimony I was hearing, that I went up. And then we got to his house, the wife was waiting. And uh, they started asking questions about prayer, about faith, about miracles, about what God can do today. And I started sharing with them and it was a wonderful time. You know what I'm telling you? You don't have to be in the bus to preach the gospel. Many of the testimonies you've been hearing on Thursdays, many of the things that happen to other people you have heard about, and all the things that have happened to you as well, you tell your neighbors, you tell your friends, you tell everybody that you meet. Now you don't have to make a noise doing that, you don't have to take a loudspeaker doing that, but tell everybody and let us see them next, this coming Thursday. And this coming Thursday, I want to see this place overflow with people that have never come here. This coming Sunday, I want to see this place overflow in the first service and second service and third service with the people that have never heard. Let us keep on preaching the gospel. Let us, let us get on telling the people that Jesus saves and Jesus delivers and Jesus is still working mighty wonders and miracles today. Now, you are going to rise up and you are going to sing that song again, Rescue the Perishing. Care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave, weep over the erring ones, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus, tell them of Jesus, tell them of Jesus, he is mighty to save. Though they are slighting him, still is waiting, waiting the penitent child to receive, plead with them earnestly, plead with them gently every day, everywhere that you go, he will forgive you if they will only believe, down in the human heart, crushed by the tempter feelings like buried that grace can restore, touched by loving hand, and waking by kindness, cause that were broken will vibrate once more. Rescue the perishing, duty demands it, strength for thy labor, the Lord will provide, back to the narrow way, patiently win them, tell the poor wanderer, his savior has died. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, Jesus is merciful, and Jesus will save.
you do it? Will you rescue the perishing? Let's open our mouth and tell the Lord. 